This week, we're going to finish our discussion of breach. Today, focusing on the UCC rules around breach. As you might imagine, the expectations in a sales agreement could be a little bit clearer and a little bit more direct than a services agreement. The typical sales transaction is a seller agrees to sell a finite amount of a certain good to the buyer at an agreed upon price. And so the buyer's expectations are understandably fairly high that they will receive exactly what they contracted to buy. So we're going to talk about how the UCC rules reflect those expectations of the parties. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end of our lecture today talking about this notion of anticipatory repudiation. As I suggested last week, you need to be really careful as a party to a contract not to inadvertently be the first person to breach the contract. And so we'll talk about scenarios, how to identify when the other party has essentially created such a material breach that you can declare even before the time that perhaps their performance is due that they have in fact breached the contract, don't intend to perform, and have in the terms that we're going to talk about today repudiated the contract. So let's start by talking about our UCC damages. First of all, the UCC Perfect Tender Rule in 2601 makes it very clear that the buyer can expect to receive exactly what they had co contracted for, what they had ordered. So if the seller makes a non-conforming delivery, the buyer has a choice at that point. They can either accept the goods, they can reject the goods, or in the words of the UCC, they can accept any commercial unit or units and reject the rest. So they could keep part of the goods. That might make sense, for instance, if some of the goods arrive broken. In that case, you might not want to keep the broken goods. Those would clearly be non-conforming. They're defective upon delivery, but you might have a reason to want to keep the conforming ones. Or you would also be within your rights to accept the whole lot, reject the whole lot, say, well, now I don't trust these particular um, mugs because they're broken, some of them are broken, maybe this means they break easily, I'm just going to send the whole lot back. And so what does it mean if a good is non-conforming? These are goods that are defective, such as you open them up and they're broken, or there's something clearly wrong with them. Uh, they're not in accordance with the contract. So let's say that you had specifications about what each good would look like and or performance specifications and the goods don't meet those specifications that you had in the contract, that would be a non-conforming good. The goods are delivered late, they're delivered to the wrong place so they don't make it to you, and the goods are improperly packaged. These are your typical reasons that people say that a good that they receive is non-conforming. Many thought that the UCC drafters might decide to adopt the common law rule of substantial performance. In a lot of respects, the UCC does allow a lot of leeway for commercial practice. But one of the things that the UCC drafters were looking at at the time that they were creating this rule was that a lot of the existing sales case law imposed a stricter standard for the reasons that we've been talking about. People have a reasonable expectation that when they order thing X, that is what they are going to get. And so the drafters chose to go with a stricter standard 
in the UCC for performance than we see necessarily in the common law. This is the perfect tender rule in 2601. So let's say, for example, you enter into a contract to buy 10,000 navy blue mugs. The seller sends you 10,000 baby blue mugs, so they're too light. Is that conforming? No. You, as the buyer, would have the right to reject them. If, on the other hand, you decided that blue is close enough and you don't want to bother with having to formally reject them and wait for new mugs to arrive, you could also choose to accept the non-conforming color mugs. The book doesn't get into the notification provisions in the UCC, but they are there. And so rest assured, the buyer does have to notify the seller of the breach. So there is this opportunity to cure, right? and that is mentioned on page 795 of your text that the limits are the seller's right to cure and that occasionally um, when we're talking about installment contracts, there is sort of the equivalent of a substantial performance standard. But I just want you to keep in mind that even though this perfect tender rule seems strict, right, the buyer still has to go to the trouble of notifying the seller that their performance has been non-conforming. So let's talk about those two items I was just mentioning, seller's right to cure and what happens with installment contracts. So contracts where the seller is shipping multiple batches of goods to a buyer. As in the common law that we were talking about last week, seller does have a right to cure the breach, but that right is more limited. Oftentimes that cure can be replacement or a refund or discount. The non-conforming delivery does need to be in good faith. Right? And as you might recall, I know I've mentioned it briefly in the past, seller does have an option for how they can behave. And so I want to make sure that I'm distinguishing. I'm not talking about a legal option. I'm saying a possibility. If they are deliberately sending non-conforming goods, they can send them to the buyer with what is called a notice of accommodation. And when the seller does that, it's treated essentially like a counter offer. We talked about it last semester in the context of offers. Right? So the idea there is if the seller is knowingly sending non-conforming goods to the buyer, but they say, I know this is non-conforming. I think that this alternative good will work for you. Right? That's a slightly different scenario. In that case, it's like the seller is just making a counter offer and the buyer is in the position to either accept that offer and say yes these goods will work I will pay you for them or reject them and say no these goods won't work please take them back seller so let's go back to cure one of the scenarios you'll recall when we were talking about non-conforming goods was being late on the delivery and for pre-delivery um, date non-conforming goods, so the goods get to the seller before the actual delivery date in the contract, in those situations, the buyer is supposed to notify the seller hey, you sent non-conforming goods, and the seller still has up until the time of delivery set in the contract to get conforming goods to the buyer. Right? 
Now, what happens if we have a post-delivery date cure? I mean, so the seller has sent the wrong goods. They're not able to get conforming goods to the buyer in time under the contract. In that case, the seller has to show that the cure is appropriate and timely under the circumstances. And so we will talk when we're discussing the problems in our live discussion, we'll talk about how a buyer might go about showing, no, it's too late. You can't send conforming goods in the time frame that I need them. Or alternatively, that the seller can say, no, you don't need these right away. We should be allowed to have this extra time to cure. Now, a note on installment contracts. In this scenario, there is something a little more akin to substantial performance in the common law. So if the goods are coming to the buyer in installments, the buyer can only reject them if the nonconformity substantially impairs the value and cannot be cured. Right? Um, so the idea here is that the substantially impaired value has to be of the entire contract in order for the buyer to reject the goods. Um, and the underlying policy behind this is something like seller has greater reliance on this deal. It's not just a one-off, this is multiple installments over time. And when you're having multiple installments over time, the odds of an occasional uh, curable defect increase. Right? The buyer is still entitled to a cure. Right? So if the goods are not conforming, right, it's not that the buyer just has to accept them, but it's that the buyer has to give the seller the opportunity to send conforming goods, unlike um, perhaps as we see in the perfect tender rule, where it seems like the buyer has much more leeway to essentially reject the entire contract. I'm happy to answer questions about distinctions between sort of the one-off application of 2601 and the installment contract application in 2612. And we'll go through those a little bit as we talk about our discussion problems. All right, I want to move on and talk briefly about this notion of anticipatory repudiation. And we have similar doctrines to some respect in both the UCC and the common law here uh, when we're talking about what the repudiation is, how it works. So anticipatory repudiation is a scenario where one party notifies the other, and I, I use notify somewhat loosely, I think, lets the other party know through word or deed that that party is not going to perform under the contract. All right, so when one party puts the other party on notice that that party is intending to breach the contract. Okay. Going back to our discussion of the last couple weeks, promises under a contract can be viewed by courts as conditions for the other party's performance. All right, these are the constructive conditions, the constructive conditions of exchange that we've been talking about. Um, and so it used to be that if one party told the other it was not going to perform, the other party had to wait until that party that notified that they were going to repudiate was actually in breach. This was actually a question in our discussion last week. Um, 
that used to be the rule that if they said we're not going to perform you actually had to sit there and wait till the time for their performance had passed they clearly did not perform only then could you start to seek remedies for non-performance all right now the non-repudiating party can stop its performance and sue right away under the contract. And as the case that we'll talk about, um, the Wholesale Sand and Gravel v. Decker case, shows us, okay, um, sometimes the notice is not that clear, but why does it matter for the non-repudiating party to be able to say, you're in breach, you've anticipatorily repudiated the contract. It's not really even so much that the non-repudiating party can sue. It's that the non-repudiating party can find an alternate vendor, an alternate provider for the performance that it needs. Right? Get that done. Get whatever they're trying to get done actually done. Presumably, it might cost a little bit more. And if that's the case, that's when they're gonna turn around and sue the repudiating party, the original breaching party to the contract. So both the restatement, common law, and the UCC take a similar approach, which is to ask whether the breach is substantial or material. And so if you're having a dispute with your uh, construction provider and they say, you know, you ordered charcoal gray counters, but we can only give you slate gray and they're very similar. And you say, well, that is a material breach. And so you are off this project. You have anticipatorily repudiated. That's going to be a tough call because we know from some of the case law that that's going to be a situation where a court might say there's still your construction contractor is still substantially performing. And, and so it might not actually be a material breach that would qualify as a total breach for anticipatory repudiation purposes. Um, now, the UCC's typical scenario is a seller telling the buyer it cannot deliver the goods that the seller has promised the buyer. Um, it could also be the buyer telling the seller, I don't have the money to pay you, don't send the goods. But it's often going to be a scenario where the seller says, nope, not going to send you the thing that you ordered that you've already paid for. Um, so the repudiation must substantially impair the value. At that point, the non-repudiating party in a UCC context, typically the buyer, can wait for performance or result, resort to other remedies. And we'll talk about UCC remedies, but um, from a buyer's perspective, those remedies are usually trying to find the goods that they need elsewhere and often having to pay more money for them. Okay. The non-repudiating party can ask for assurance of performance and suspend its performance until assurance received. Oftentimes you have scenarios where say, the buyer has agreed to buy certain goods from seller. The buyer hears rumors that seller might not be doing so well financially and buyer doesn't really want to send the seller money unless they feel comfortable that they're going to receive the goods. Situation like that. And in that case, the buyer could ask for assurances that indeed they are going to receive the goods. Now, as we'll talk about in our problems, can the buyer change the terms of the contract to say, oh, we'll just change it so that I don't pay you in advance. I'll pay you when I get the goods. Mm, probably not. So assurances um, are nice, but let's think about how much weight those really have in these situations. Um, and 
the UCC also essentially allows a party to walk their repudiation back unless the other party has already canceled the contract or materially changed their position. Uh, in other words, let's say this is the seller can't deliver the goods scenario, seller notifies the buyer, buyer says, oh, well, I guess I should see about getting other goods, never goes about doing it, right? The seller, if they can still find the goods and deliver them on the date required by the contract, the seller can walk back its repudiation and say, oh no, actually we found a supplier, we have the goods available, we're shipping to them to you by the date under the contract. And if the buyer hasn't already notified the seller, oh, I'm canceling, or oh, I already got the goods elsewhere because you said you weren't gonna get them to me, then the contract can essentially be restored. In common law, um, also, you know, essentially has the take back provision. We see that in R2K 256. The party can nullify their repudiation if the other party has not materially changed their position or indicated, nope, you have repudiated. I am done with you. I am seeking another vendor for this service. Um, the important thing in you know, both the UCC and the common law is that once a party has repudiated, the other party can then seek remedies right? and refuse to perform. So if you say, I am not going to perform my portion of this contract, the other party now has the ability to say, oh, okay, I'm not gonna perform my portion of this contract either and you breached first so you are the one that's going to be liable because going back to the beginning of this chapter that's the big question who breached first because they're the person that's going to be liable add to that our discussion last class of how big of a breach is it is it material or is it not a material breach? Because right? that is going to affect what sort of damages a party can seek, which is what we'll talk about in class on Friday. So tomorrow we will discuss these notions of perfect tender and anticipatory repudiation, and I'll see you then.